I want to take you back to first day of middle school. First day of middle school, and for some of you, uh, that was really recent. For some of you, that was a very long time ago. Uh, for me, I have to go back to the mid-80s. The mid-80s is when I was in middle school, and on the first day of school, I am trying to figure out how to open my locker for the first time. Now, we don't do lockers anymore around here, uh, but that was a great privilege back then, and as we learned from Spider-Man, with great privilege comes great responsibility, the responsibility to know how to open your locker. So it's the first day of middle school. I had my locker combo memorized. I did this because I wanted to be prepped for my first day. We do middle school around here, 6th, 7th, and 8th, so I'm a little 6th grader coming into Rogers Middle School over by Westgate Shopping Center. I have the written combo in my pocket as a backup. Do you see how prepared I am for middle school? I'm going to kill this. I just knew it. So I go to my assigned locker. I check my surroundings because in middle school, I want to make sure I am in the safe middle of what all my peers are doing at all times. So I'm sure that I checked before I did this. I go to my locker, and here's what I do. Ready, set, go. Right, 23. Left, 2. Right, 14. Now I take the little metal thing I lift up. It doesn't open. Now, that's not my real combo. I wouldn't trust you with my junior high locker combo. (laughs) Kidding, I don't remember it. That's made up, but the rest of it isn't made up. So I do it, I lift nothing. I clear the thing and I try again. Nada. Now my heart starts to beat a little bit, okay? Again, I wanna stay in the safe middle socially of my middle school peers. Evidently everyone else knows how to open the locker except for this guy. So here's what I do. Panic begins to set in. I take a deep breath. Think, Dave. You've got this. You're not going to be conquered by a rectangle piece of metal. Not on this day. I had to give myself a pep talk because in middle school, there's no one there to do it for you. I do this in my head because I don't want to appear psychotic on the first day of school. So I slowly do it again. 23 to the right, 2 to the left, 14 to the right. Again, nothing. Here's the problem. Whoever gave me the locker combo was an expert on locker combos. And sometimes experts aren't the most helpful. Now what you probably know, but Junior High Dave did not know, is that when you go right 23, you have to go counterclockwise past 23 to your next number. Nobody ever explained that to me. So here I am, panicking on my first day of school. I think I had a friend come and bail me out. I didn't have to carry my books around, which would have been death on the first day of sixth grade, but I eventually got the thing open and got to use it. Here's the point. It's called the curse of knowledge. The curse of knowledge is that experts aren't always the most helpful. This is true in a lot of fields. Let me give you a couple that kind of come to mind. Teachers, lawyers, doctors, pastors. Sometimes supposedly experts are not that much help because they haven't been a beginner in a long, long time. And they make these leaps of knowledge saying, I, of course you know that you're supposed to go past 23 before you go to 14. But if you're a beginner, you don't know these things. Here's what I want to show you today is that Jesus' expertise never devolved into unhelpfulness. He is unlike any teacher you will ever have. His expertise never sets him up and above you to where he's unhelpful to you. We see this time and again in the scriptures and we're going to see it today really, really clearly. What I needed in junior high is someone to unlock my stuckness. What was my stuckness? I literally didn't know how to unlock my locker combo. That's what I needed. That was my problem, and I needed someone to come alongside. And sometimes other beginners, like other uh, first day of sixth grade students, can come over and say, no, 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 you got you to gotta go past it and then do it. Oh, okay. Once you're shown it, it's super easy. 2 Timothy chapter 3.16. By the way, we're going to 2 Timothy next week. We're going to go through the, the letter. We went through 1 Timothy a little while ago, and we're going to pick up 1 Timothy, or 2 Timothy. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable. 
Now, this goes on to kind of give some categories for it, but hear this really clearly. All Scripture is profitable. All Scripture is profitable. We looked early on in this series that of your Bible, if you have a physical Bible, there are some pages that are very worn and sort of dirtied and highlighted and underlined, and they're your favorite go-to sections, and there may be other places in your Bible where literally you're peeling pages apart because they've never been opened. What this series says is all Scripture is profitable, so how do we get the most out of it? Uh, In our series picture, those little shapes, those little shapes are genres of the Bible, And when you see how one genre of literature is read and understood and what its purpose is, it really helps you a lot to understand the story. Think about departments at Home Depot. If you are looking for a new screwdriver in the garden section of of, of Home Depot, you're in a world of hurt. You want to refine it there, right? You have to know the department. And if you understand the department you're in, then it helps give framework to kind of how the rest of it all fits together. So law is one such genre of the Bible. And if you look at Genesis to Revelation, there's a whole lot of law going on in the Bible, right? We looked uh, last week or two weeks ago. Is the Bible a book of do's and don'ts? Everyone's kind of like, sort of. Yes, it's not the main message of it, but there's a lot of do's and don'ts in there. If you were to read Genesis to Revelation, you'll see it. There's lots of do's and don'ts in the Bible. So to read and apply biblical law is profitable. To read and apply biblical law is profitable. But it's dangerous. It's really, really dangerous to do it. And we're going to see that today. Some of you are like, that sounds so scary. All right, we're going to get to it and we will, we will do it. Here's, what, here's the key that unlocks this. Doing what this series says to do is the guard to keep reading biblical law from becoming dangerous. It's to read over Jesus' shoulder. How does Jesus read and understand law? How does he apply it? So before the Bible is ours to apply, it is his to fulfill. Okay. If we keep that framework, it's going to help us. Without the lens of Jesus... You will misread, misunderstand, and misapply the Bible, period. We will tend to think it's about us. We will tend to think it's about our culture and our problems and our current philosophy of thinking. We will misunderstand it. Every drop of the ocean of the Bible flows to and through the person of Jesus, So as we read Genesis to Revelation, we have to keep coming back to Jesus. All right, turn in your Bibles to Matthew 22. If you don't have a Bible, there's a Bible sitting right in front of you. I'd invite you to open up and look at it. I'm going to put a couple verses on the screen, but to kind of get the full context, you'll need to kind of see it in front of you. So Matthew chapter 22. We're going to look at Jesus and lawyers today. Now, lawyers have a weirdly mixed reputation, don't you think? Like, if you have a smart little guy, people might say, oh, he's a smart one. He's going to be a doctor or a lawyer someday. It always gets paired with that, like the really smart kids, the advanced kids. And yet, at the same time, are you surprised that lawyers consistently make lists where they say, what are the least trustworthy and least ethical professions? Are you surprised that lawyers are near the top of that list? Does that surprise anyone? Okay. Now, some of you are parents of lawyers. I already know that. I'm looking at some of you might be aspiring lawyers. Some of you might be former lawyers or current lawyers. My apologies to any of that. Again, weirdly mixed. We sort of admire you, but we sort of don't trust you. Uh, There's a saying that goes, 99% of lawyers give the rest a bad name, right? Um, there's 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 just sort of a weird thing with lawyers going on. Maybe it's this. Perhaps lawyers get this reputation because knowing law and doing law are completely two different things. It's the same with pastors, by the way. The reason a pastor that falls is you know they can't, they can't fall on the idea of like, well, I had no idea what the Bible taught. I had no idea it was wrong. So the hypocrisy is extra when there's, when there's lawyers getting in and using the law to break the law. And we can see through that. Now, if you think of any lawyers in the Bible, my hunch is it's probably a negative example. You can think of some lawyers in the Bible, can't you? 
Let me give you one positive that you may not have known. I had to go hunt for this guy. I'm like, are there any examples of positive lawyers in the Bible? Titus chapter 3. You don't need to write this down. This is just a weird little thing. Titus 3.13. Paul's writing, he says this, do everything you can to help Zenos the lawyer and Apollos with their trip. <laughs> See that they are given everything they need. Now, here's why I think Zenos the lawyer was a good example. Here's why. Um, Paul says, give them everything they need, not everything they deserve, right? If it was like, give them everything they deserve, Zenos the lawyer is probably a bad dude. But I think trying to provide for his needs, I think Zenos the lawyer was probably a good guy. We learn to do law by reading over Jesus' shoulder. Let me just review last week in one sentence, and that's this, that Jesus did not come to abolish the law. We don't get to say, well, the Old Testament, that's Old Covenant. That has nothing to do with me. I'm a Christian, and it's all about Jesus. Jesus doesn't back you up on that. Jesus says, I didn't come to abolish the law, but what? To fulfill it. He says, not the tiniest stroke of a pen, not not an atom of ink is going to be erased from the law. I love how this one guy puts it. Um, Kevin DeYoung, he says... um, that the law in the Old Testament to New Testament, it's like music being transposed. If you transpose to a different key or a different octave, the melody is still the same. The song is still the same, but it, but it heightens. It changes. Every single note changes because you're in a transposed key. So the law doesn't change. Jesus didn't come and change the law. He came and transposed it. Everything changes because Jesus and his work and resurrection So because of that, here's the exciting thing. Every single time you come across an ethical dilemma, every single time you come through a law and it's confusing and hard for you to understand, you can celebrate that your spotless Savior fulfilled that perfectly. He lived that spotlessly. That means that as we praise God, our worship will never stale. As you read confusing Old Testament laws that you just go, how is that God's eternal word for his people? What did that, how did that make sense? As we dig into that, it actually gives us new, fresh ways to praise Jesus. Now, this sounds like a bad joke, but Jesus, two lawyers, and a moralist walk into, not a bar, but into a conversation. That's what we're going to do today, okay? Three conversations, two lawyers, and a moralist. The first one's found in Matthew 22. You're already there. Let me put up just the opening verses. But when the Pharisee heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, Jesus, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. If you're taking notes today, and I hope you are because you probably don't have a photographic memory, write this down. I'm going to give you three things from these conversations about how do we understand law according to Jesus. Here's number one. Rules are rooted in relationships. Rules are rooted in relationship. Verse 36, teacher, this is the question from the lawyer, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Do you see that Jesus summarizes the complexity of the law and the prophets? That's code, by the way, for the entire Old Testament. He summarizes the complexity of the law and the prophets on these two commands. Love God, love your neighbor. That's it. He roots it in relationship. Now that's stated in a positive way. If you state this in a negative way, think about this with your own upbringing. Think about this with your own children that you may be raising or aspiring to raise. That rules without relationship leads to rebellion. Rules without relationship leads to rebellion. If you were to Google that right now, do you know who gets credit for that? A guy by the name of Josh McDowell. Josh McDowell's an, an apologist. His son, Sean McDowell, is actually preaching at, uh, at Hillside Church coming up. They're apologists. They go around college campuses and places and kind of defend the Christian faith. What's funny is even though Josh McDowell is sort of famous for that, he gets it from Jesus. Rules without relationship leads to rebellion. It's true in your household that you grew up in. It's true in your household that you're trying to raise. It's true in our walk with God. That's the warning. You know, there's a great shock. I was a youth pastor for a lot of years. You guys know that. And there's a great shock, especially for parents, 
when their oldest starts to hit right around 6th, 7th, 8th grade. Kind of like learning to walk, there's different ranges of when this comes out. But sometimes there's a lot of shock because that oldest child, all of a sudden there will be all this anger. All this anger sort of shooting at, at mom and dad in particular. Now a part of that is just backing up with this, what the Bible says, that we are born with a sin nature. Those cute little cuddly children that we have around here, love them, they're sinners. I mean, it's just, it's just the plain truth. You, no one wants to say it, but the Bible says it. And so what happens is that incubates for all this time, and then it, it starts to come out. So that's a natural thing to happen. But if there have been rules without relationship, there is a depth of anger and rebellion and pulling away and testing and saying, I want to get as far away from this as possible. And that sometimes shocks parents because they may have been raising a compliant child who just says, you know what, my way of just dealing with this is I'm just going to kind of skate through, but I can't wait to get out from mom and dad's rule. And that starts to sort of sneak out right around middle school. So those of you with fifth graders, welcome. You're going to have a great time. This is why we need the church. Now, as you read Old Testament law, and if you take Old Testament law and you take New Testament ethics, we're not even going to take time to see this, but if you, if you look at Paul's writing, Peter's writing, Jesus himself, he uses the Ten Commandments as a shorthand for New Testament ethics. So when I say Old Testament law, think Old Testament law and New Tes- Testament ethics. Okay, those are, kind of, those are kind of paired up. As you read those things, it's so important not to rush to applying it. It's so important not to just read something and say, okay, that's what I need to go do. Here's why. It may lead to you becoming a moralist or something worse. We'll, we're we're going to look at a moralist as sort of our third conversation here, but here's what, here's what we do. We stop and we think, how does Jesus fulfill this? How does Jesus fulfill this law? Before I go to try and fulfill the law, how does Jesus fulfill the law? But even then, you shouldn't rush off. Once you get your answer, you shouldn't rush off and try and do it. Because you still may be rushing off and trying to be Jesus in that situation. Newsflash, you're not Jesus. And neither am I. Here's the powerful thing, though. If we stop and think, how did Jesus fulfill this? And then wait a little bit longer to ponder this. How does my relationship to Jesus who fulfills this, change it for me. Now I'm ready to apply. Do you see the difference? My relationship to Jesus changes everything. Of course it changes how I read law, how I go about ethical, uh, moral dilemmas that are, are in front of me. This is where the heart of misunderstanding happens for so many people regarding rules. Let me ask you all a question, and this is not the kind that I ask, I sometimes ask for feedback. This is like, just keep it to yourself. <laughs> Have you ever been in trouble with the law? Okay, keep your hands in. No pointing, no nudging. Have you ever been in trouble with the law? Now, if your immediate response is, I am not answering that until I have my lawyer present. You've already given me your answer, right? I mean, if you have a lawyer, if you know to remain quiet until your lawyer's present, I think I probably already have my answer. What's the biblical answer? The biblical answer is yes to every single person here. Not only have you been in trouble with the law, you are in trouble with the law right now. Even the pastor, especially the pastor. You are in trouble with the law. Here's why. The law says that you are guilty. Every single one of you, every single one of us, guilty, guilty, guilty. The law shows us our guilt. We are in trouble with the law. Now, the solution for people being in trouble with the law, think about how bizarre this is, for many people is more law. Let me lean into that. The trouble with being in in, in trouble with the law is more law. That's not the solution. The solution is relationship every single time. As a guilty person, I am left with no other recourse for acquittal except to throw myself at the mercy of the court. 
We went through the book of Romans. I'm taking my 11-year-old through the book of Romans. It's an awesome thing. It's amazing that you can get Romans at this level, this level, this level, and there's people like scoping the depths of Romans still that, that are still there. But the plain, simple message, for all have sinned and what? Fallen short of the glory of God. What's the wages of sin? It's death. So we are all guilty from the law. Our solution is not more law, it's relationship. Now, the first relationship is sinful man with a holy God. This is why this is the great and first commandment. Jesus starts there. Without that first relationship in place, if you aren't submitted to God, if you don't fall on your face and acknowledge Him as Lord and orient your entire life and renounce and repent of sin, then there's no moving on. In fact, if you move on to law at that point, it will always pervert. It will always go sideways. It will always get smelly very, very quickly. That's the first and greatest commandment. By the way, no amount of teaching, training, hoping, or praying will ever change the unregenerate heart. There are many people that say, I prayed about it, I hoped for it, I got counsel for it, I was in a Bible study for it, I attended church for it, I was the pastor preaching on it. If you do not have an unregenerate heart, it means you're dead to God and alive to sin. And in that state, you are naturally hostile to the Word of God and to God Himself. You aren't submitting. So there's no hope in that. The hope is a regenerate heart. So much preaching, praying, and advice giving does no good to change that person until they're in a right relationship with God. What's the first and greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God. How? With all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. Does that sound like every single thing that you are all the time, every day, for the rest of your life? Yes! Whew! Now that that's settled, now we can move on to applying law and reading law and looking at what law is, because it won't be something to us that it's not. Turn to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Here's a second lawyer, different person, different occasion. Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 25. It says the following. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit inherit eternal life? We're going to look at the answer in just a second, but let me just leave the question there, and here's the principle Jesus is going to get at, that laws are for life. Laws are for life. Rules are meant to be lived and not just known. Before we go on, can we just see how badly these lawyers are behaving? We have two different lawyers. This is why lawyers get a bad reputation, even in the Bible. First one asked Jesus a question, not to learn something, but to test him. Second one stood up to address him, not as a student, but as a teacher. What do teachers do? They give tests. What's this lawyer doing? He's testing Jesus. Even if he uses the right words, he's still standing over Jesus as a teacher, not a student. Let me say something that may may cause some of you to get angry at me. I don't know. But if you're come to Jesus moment, if your come to Jesus moment was filled with questions that were meant to test or to trap Jesus, you aren't saved. Saving faith begins with humility and need, right? Humility and need. If you don't have humility and need, instead you're testing and trapping Jesus, You need a new come to Jesus moment. Maybe that was part one, to realize that you can't test and trap Jesus. You aren't the teacher of Jesus. Many of you have friends, family, coworkers, classmates, who whenever they want to talk about Jesus, it's always to test and trap. That's it. That's all they ever want to do with this. All that does is just kind of reveal a heart condition. Saving faith starts with humility and need. All right, verse 26. Let's look at his answer. He said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he, the lawyer, answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. There it is. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my 
neighbor. What's the principle that we're trying to get at? Laws are for living, not just knowing. What does Jesus say? How does the law read? Do this and you will live. Don't just know the law, do the law. Every single one of us, from the time we were little, are superheroes at not doing what we know to do. We're great at it. We're so good at this, aren't we? Most of us here in this room, it's not that we're like, you know what, I would live more like Jesus if I just knew what I was supposed to be doing. We're superheroes at not doing what we already know to do. These lawyers were the same way. This lawyer is trying to find happiness and wholeness, potentially his identity in being a rule keeper. And he wants to get technical with Jesus, desiring to justify himself. This is another pitfall of rules. Remember I said that rules are dangerous? One of the pitfalls is right here. It's desiring to justify himself. Self-saving by law-keeping. Self-saving by law-keeping. Desiring to justify himself. Self-righteous. Aren't these the very messages? These are the people Jesus went after. Exposing. That's a lie. That's a lie as old as sin itself. Self-justification is no justification at all. You're still in trouble with the law. So how does the law fit in with Jesus? Jesus gives us his opinion of the law by his answer. Verse 26, he said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? What is Jesus' opinion of the law? He thinks that it's active. He thinks that it's on point. He thinks it's still applicable. He thinks it's ready and present. He doesn't think it's far off and removed. He thinks it is sufficient to answer this question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, go read your Bible. Church, this is, this is so powerful. I probably sound like a broken record to some of you. But when I am preaching up here, I am trying to show you from the Scriptures what I'm getting from the Scriptures so that you can also do these same things. This does not require a seminary degree, uh, a Bible degree, years of training and knowledge, study in the Greek and Hebrew. All of those things are great. I'm actually for all of those things. But with the Spirit of God in you, illuminating what you're reading, and a heart willing to meekly receive the implanted word, you've got this. It's sufficient. What does the Bible say? Man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. If this is true, and Jesus said it, so I, I believe it to be true, here's what I think is happening in the American church to some degree. Not everyone in this room, not necessarily our church, but I think there is a famine going on where people should be feasting. Inside the church, people are not feasting on the Word of God. Pastors around the world get asked these questions all the time. I'm no exception. People come and say, my marriage is in shambles. People come to me and say, I have massively increased anxiety. I don't know what to do. People come to me and say, I can't shake this sin. It's a besetting sin. I've tried this. I've tried that. Let me tell you, if, if you're going to do that this coming week, let me tell you one of my opening go-to responses is this. What does the Bible say? How do you read it? What is God saying to you? He's already spoken. Are you seeking out what God has already spoken of? Why would you come talk to a study leader and not talk to the author of the scriptures himself? Him, himself? Of course start there. Many, many times, and don't hear shame on this, just hear exhortation to be in your word. Many times when pastors say, what has God already said on this? What are you already hearing and doing from, from, from God? There are blank stares that come back at pastors. I don't know. That's why I'm asking you. <laughs> right? Like, pastor, help me out. You go get the answer. The answer is found in the searching. It's not that the scriptures change, but a part of that is God will speak to you, teach you directly, guide you directly as you go and do this. It doesn't mean I won't direct you to passages. It doesn't mean I won't engage in this conversation, but that will be my opening conversation. And it's because what Jesus did, Jesus refers you to the Bible. 
It must be sought after and read. This isn't hard. He doesn't even say go to obscure passages. He's talking about the law. What is written in the law? How do you read it? Now, lawyers do what lawyers do. He gets an A+. Plus. He gives the right answer, right? But this lawyer nails it but still fails it. Why does he do that? Because he got the right biblical answer, but he's not living it, desiring to justify himself. A disciple, who he, a disciple in really simple terms is one who hears and does what Jesus says. If you have ears to hear, but you don't have feet to follow Jesus, you're not a disciple of Jesus. If you have feet to follow Jesus, but you don't really give a rip about what he says, his voice isn't loudest in your decision-making process, you're not a disciple of Jesus. So it boils down to, this guy had the right head knowledge, but wasn't a follower. Now here's what's really amazing, Jesus, this prompts a story from Jesus to answer. And just who is my neighbor? What's the story? Commonly referred to as the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan. Is there a worse title for a parable of Jesus in all of Scripture? I don't think so. Here's why. If we get the context of what we are talking about, many, 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 many people through centuries have read the Good Samaritan with this as the moral of the story. If I help people in need and do good... I will be good. That's not what it's talking about. That's actually exactly opposite of what Jesus is illustrating. What prompts the story? Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's not go do good for people who've been beat up and robbed. Then you'll be good. That's not it at all. So anyways, that's a whole side thing. Dave, Dave's getting worked up about the Good Samaritan. Wow, my pastor hates the Good Samaritan. I don't. I just think it's sort of a terrible name. All right. Number three. So rules are about relationships. You separate them from relationships, it goes astray. Laws are for living, not just knowing. Here's the last exchange that I want you to see. It's found in Mark chapter 10. I'll give you a second to get there. I'm going to take another. I'm drinking a lot of water today. Now, we don't have a lawyer. There's two lawyers and a moralist. So here's the moralist. Mark 10, 17. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Here's the principle I want you to see and write down. It's this, that laws protect and serve the inner life. You want to hear kind of a cool metaphor? Eugene Peterson, I read this this week. Totally separate book, different idea, but he said, laws are like the bark of a tree. They're there to protect and guard the inner life. They aren't the life themselves. They're there for a totally different purpose. And Jesus would, would, would say exactly the same thing. Verse 18, and Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And do you see that he refers back to law? You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. Look at me for a second. Every single one of you and me, is this curious mix of external and internal. Do something kind of weird for a second. Grab your arm. Touch that arm. Feel that arm. If you're able to, like, let it go limp and lift your arm up. Just hold it there for a second, okay? Now, external, right? Are you your arm? No, you're more than your arm, right? You're part external. You can stop holding your arm. Like, that's just really weird. Can I put my arm down? Yes, put your arm down. You could lose a limb... And still be you. Is that correct? Of course. Why? Because the internal, the internal part of you, not just internal organs, but external internal, your soul is more of who you are than just this arm. There's an external and an internal to all of us. We're we're sort of this curious mix of both. The final danger in law keeping is to be focused on the outside of the cup. Focused on the external. Focused on the front-facing. We all have a front-facing persona that we are projecting in some way, shape, or form. There's a social media brand of you that you sort of promote. 
And again, it's sort of whatever's out there, right? Some of you are sort of witty and self-depreciating humor. Some of you are, you know, glitzy and have it all perfect together. Some of you are like, yeah, I check it once every five years. But there's some kind of persona that we do, whether we have social media accounts or not, that says this is who I want to project. This is who I want to appear to be. Here's what's interesting. God is not fooled or impressed by anything external that we can do if it's being used to mask the internal. We know this. Not challenging. Look at this guy. He comes and he kneels. In a shame-honor culture, that's going to be the most important thing, right? I'm humbly coming and kneeling before this person. Outwardly, he looks very, very submissive. He also asks. If you ask a question, that gives the appearance of humility, I don't know something. I'm putting myself in your debt. I'm asking you a question. Thirdly, he addresses him as good teacher. Now, here's what's kind of fascinating. The the externalness of that is that he looks theologically astute. He's actually right that Jesus is good. But Jesus kind of does this little curveball on him, and he says, why do you call me good? The guy says the right theological thing, but for the wrong reasons. He doesn't know he's right. Only God alone is good. Jesus doesn't deny being good. Jesus is God. This guy isn't approaching Jesus as God. So he kneels, he asks, and he addresses. It's all a sham. It's all external. This guy on the inside is something different. Shiny pics and funny quips on Instagram is is who many people project themselves to be. Those of us who know them intimately go, wow, that's not who they actually are. Some of the biggest social influencers, social media influencers, are known by a close circle. I think Matt brought this up in a a sermon one time. But known by by an intimate few who go, "That that is not the person who should be giving advice on that subject at all. Easy to sort of promote the external. Verse 19, again, Jesus says, you know the commandments. He points him back to the law. You already know how to live in relationship with God and others. This is so important that God wrote it down. Now, I just happen to have my pocket edition of the Ten Commandments here. I carry this with me where I go sometimes. And um, this this is my little pocket version. And... If you look at one table of the Ten Commandments, it's our relationship with God. It starts there. What's the first and greatest commandment? That we love God, right? But what's the second one all about? The second table of the Ten Commandments is what Jesus is walking this guy through. It's how I relate to neighbor. It's how I relate to my closest neighbor, my spouse, right? So here's the second table of the commandments. Jesus takes him back to the law because this guy hasn't learned the lesson of the law yet. Do you know what the lesson of the law is? The lesson of the law of God is that you can't keep the law. That's it. You know the lesson of the law? It's that you can't keep the law. It is meant to show you you're in trouble with the law. Does this guy seem like he's in trouble with the law? You guys know how this guy answers. He says, man, all those things I've kept from my youth. He doesn't think he's in trouble with the law at all. Look at Romans chapter 3. It says, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. Self-righteousness is still a problem. There's a whole new brand of self-righteousness going on in our cultural conversation. We looked at this a couple summers ago or last summer where people are now putting their secular creed on their front lawns. In this house, we believe in these absolutes. And carried with every single one of those is a moral ought. You ought to believe in it too. God's laws are higher than man's laws. God's laws have been written down for a really long time. Jesus keeps referring back to them. Look at verse 20. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So because this guy hasn't graduated that lesson, Jesus gives him law. A principle we talk about here all the time. Read through the gospel sometime with this little filter. Law to the proud, grace to the humble. People come to Jesus with pride, he gives them law. 
People come to Jesus with humility, like the woman caught in adultery. What does he say? He gives her grace. Where are your accusers, woman? Then neither do I condemn you. Is he soft on sin? No. Go and sin no more. Law to the proud, grace to the humble. You want to come and test and trap Jesus? He'll give you law every time. Your mouth will be shut if you're being honest. If you come in humility and need, you throw yourself at the mercy of the court. I'm in trouble with the law. You'll find the grace of Jesus every time. Here's what's really powerful. You know the commandments, Jesus says. You know why? Because God didn't make them hidden or plain. God didn't make them complicated. You know the commandments. The words of of rebuke to a proud person are actually words of encouragement to the humble. The words of rebuke to a proud person, you know the commandments, are actually words of empowerment to the humble. Here's what I mean by that. Jesus is granting access to life. He's simplifying things down. He's making it really accessible. He's opening the way of life to all who would receive it. Do you have to even be able to read and write to know the Ten Commandments? Say no. No. You can memorize that. You can know the Ten Commandments. Let me show you a really uh, helpful little thing that covers every single law in the Bible. This is not a junior high locker combination, by the way. But if you write these three numbers down, it will take the biblical law and put it in three numbers that you can remember. Some of you already know where I'm going with this, but here it is. 613. Those are the rules and commandments of Mosaic law. If you work your way through Numbers, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, this is what what people traditionally have said. There are 613 rules and regulations that come from the Mosaic law. What's 10? 10 is the 10 commandments. There are 10 commandments, right? What's the two? Jesus sums up all those 613 and the 10 with two great loves. Why? Because rules are rooted in relationship. It's not even two rules, is it? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. We have a value as a staff around here. This guy's heard it a million times. We bring it up all the time. Make it helpful, not just truthful. Make it helpful, not just truthful. Jesus didn't go around being an expert causing confusion for all of us peons who can't really get it. He spoke of seeds and wheat and people going on a journey and inherit. I mean, all these things that are really familiar to all of us. He simplified it for us. Life isn't simple, so he wasn't simplistic, but he simplified it for us. 613.10.2. Helpful little thing that Jesus is doing. It actually works in reverse as well. Do you see that if all I said was, well, sweet, I'm just taking the two. That's the cliff note version. I'm just going to love God and love other people. Here's the problem. How do you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? As a kid... You can kind of be given that and go, yeah, that's good. As you start to get complex things, you go, well, do I get to define what love of God looks like? Or has God spoken to that? He has spoken to that. Go to the Ten Commandments. And so it works in reverse to sort of, as life gets complex and you go, well, what about this? What about that ethical dilemma? What does it look like to love other people? What about opposing what they're doing but not opposing that person? How do I do that? Friends, the Bible speaks to that. We know the commands. When you hold the Bible, you have what is sufficient for your inner life with God. This man is focused on the external external compliance of the law. Teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. Jesus gives him one more. What was it? Go and sell everything you have and give it away to the poor. What does the guy do? He goes away, catch this, disheartened. Dis what? disheartened. Why? Because rules kill. You separate out rules from relationship, it kills you from the inside out. It'll steal your heart. You'll become like old Grinch outside Whoville with a tiny little heart, trying to keep the rules. No inner life. There was a guy who was all fired up about Jesus he would call me and want to talk about different things, and 
He would tell me all the time about the things he was doing, the places he was going, this whole new vocabulary, all this stuff. He even bought a bunch of Jesus clothes. And every time I ever talked to this guy, I kept trying to go right here into the heart of things. I'd say, Jesus doesn't really care about that. God doesn't care about that. The Bible doesn't speak to whether you should wear that shirt or that shirt. That doesn't matter. What's going on in here? You know what would never happen? We'd never talk about in here. Did this person's faith, like Psalm 1, a tree firmly planted by a river, growing up to produce fruit in season and out of season, is that what happened in this person's life? No. The seed that goes in and the cares of this world kind of quickly took it away. Jesus cares about the internal. Here's your homework for this week. This is in your community group, so you don't have to write it down. You can just read it. The rest of the Sermon on the Mount from that Matthew 5 passage that we looked at, there's a pattern where it lets us read over Jesus' shoulder about what he thinks about the law. Once I say it, you're going you're gonna to totally recognize the pattern. Here it is. Ready? Jesus says, you have heard it said, but I say to you. You've heard it said, but I say to you. Here's what he's getting at. Every single thing he's going to say, you heard it said, is a law. This is the good law of God. But when he says, but I say to you, he's giving the deeper meaning. Don't just go for external compliance. So here's an example. Matthew 5, 21 on anger. You've heard it said by those of old, you shall not murder. That sounds familiar. You've heard it said, you shall not murder. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother is liable to judgment. Murder is about anger, inner life stuff. Again, if we try to solve the law with more law, we'll fail every single time. Jesus is drawing us into his life to say, I don't want you just not to go around not killing people. I want you to love people. All right, that's your homework. Work your way, however long it takes you. Just kind of work your way through. Here's what you're going to get to, by the way. Adultery, divorce, truth-telling, retaliation, loving enemies, giving to the needy, not for show, but for love. Man, that's a powerful life. That's the life Jesus invites us into. I'm going to give you one more verse, and this is going to help us wrap up our Foster Care Awareness Month. This is Paul grabbing hold of Jesus' method of simplifying and summarizing. Do you see see Paul as a disciple of Jesus here? I love it. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. People come and say, I'm a new Christian. What should I do? Right here. Just bear one another's burdens. Do that. Do you hear the summary of the second table right here? Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Love your neighbor as yourself. Count their needs as more important than your own needs. One of the ways we do that at this church is we care for vulnerable children. If you are new to this church, that's the church you have found yourself in. We rush in and we care for vulnerable children. We do that around the world and we do that in our own city. Who needs bearing of their needs more than babies, children, teenagers without a loving and stable and safe home right now? That's who. Let me give you some shocking news that you won't find on a news channel. I discovered it through two two of my teammates this week. That's how recent this is. For the last nine months, we have been having zero to five kids entering the foster care system in Santa Clara County. Zero to five. Now, on the one hand, you would hear that and say, yes, yes. What's the goal of Foster the City? That would have a waiting list of gospel-motivated, government-approved homes, a long line of those waiting to receive kids as they need care. We're getting there. Are we more than enough? We're right there, zero to five. 
This sounds like a giant win, and the county is actually touting this as a victory, but it's not. Sometimes things are more complex than we think. What's happening is this. Kids are being left in bad situations longer. Or they're being pulled out for just a day or two and returned very, very quickly to unstable, unsafe conditions. Zero to five kids are entering foster care in Santa Clara County. Of the 10 Bay Area counties, we are the biggest need of foster care in our county. A lawyer friend of one of my teammates, Christina, we saw her video a couple weeks ago, is thoroughly baffled by this. They have no work. Social workers are seeing this as a giant terrifying thing. There is a wave of need coming. By the way, this is the mode of our, of our government handling this. There is a wave to remove every single kid in the, in the system and get them in group homes, get them in other homes. Then it swings far this way. Remember the wind of doctrine going here and there? That's what's happening right now. Let me tell you the sad, shocking thing of what often it takes to yank the county or a government out of its current mode. It's that a child must be sacrificed. Now, that sounds really shocking. Here's what I mean by that. Something horrific has to go on and make the news. And then they'll say, you know what? We need to start putting kids in homes more again. Church, I want to bring you that news to you just because we are a frontline church. We have other churches in our area who are excelling right now at clothing um, uh, closet kinds of ministry, uh, volunteers at recovery places, low-income schools, homeless shelters, etc. By the way, when they don't get removed, that's where these kids end up. So we are telling our Foster City partner churches who are doing good at those, go find these kids, go get them. I'll tell you what we say to our church. This church has specialized in people welcoming children into their home. Church, my prayer for you, search the scriptures, search the Lord, and say, God, can we continue to be a church that is raising up families? There is a wave of need coming. There are not zero to five kids in need in our county. There's just zero to five coming into the system right now. So on your chair right now, uh, and this is how we're just wrapping up uh, our month, Band, why don't you come on up? This is a next step card. And there's a couple of really clear options here. One is attending an interest meeting. One is saying, I want to check out what it means to be a foster family. One, one is, I want to support those who are fostering. One is, I want to be a financial giver to this. We joyfully take no money from the government. You know what that means? We get to do whatever the heck we want. <laughs> you know what we want to do? We want to... We want to love God and love people, unentangled by the government doing things. Church, we get to bear one another's burdens, not just in here, not just in our own home, but to look outside, be blessed, to be a blessing to the neighborhood. God has done this over and over and over again. Many of the people who have done this, the legacy for 16 years are gone. They're in other states. So again, my heart and prayer is just, God, there's room for one more here in our church right now. Lord, we just thank you for, um, for touching us, God, for opening our eyes. We are no smarter or more diligent or more spiritual than any other person. If we are alive and awake to you, it's because you've made us alive and awake to you. God, we want to remain oriented, facing you, following you turning from a life of sin, turning from a life of self-reliance, self-righteousness, and God leaning wholly on what you would say, where you would lead us, how you would comfort, guide, and teach us. Lord, thank you for each person here in this room. Thank you for people watching online, for people watching outdoors. We love you and commit ourselves to you. Amen.